Hello everybody, the Imperator Rome 1.3 update has just dropped, and I'm going to go through all of the features, some of my thoughts about them, and whether the game is worth trying now if you haven't. I get a lot of comments asking where this video was. I don't get stuff early from Paradox anymore, so I go as quick as I can. Alright, so let's get into it. Statesmanship. Characters now have a new stat called Statesmanship. This is basically their effectiveness in a job, and it ranges from 0 to 100%. It's actually called Experience in the game files, which kind of gives you a better idea of what it is. If a character has a job, they'll begin gaining statesmanship over time, becoming more effective at their job. If they stop working, then their statesmanship will decay over time. Fresh characters start off with no statesmanship, and so only utilize a fraction of their potential stats, whereas people who've held office for a long time will be much more effective. So this means that the game is now less forgiving, because you can no longer just swap characters around without a significant penalty. Now when you've got a guy with low loyalty, you might want to consider making him happy if he's a seasoned statesman, instead of just replacing him with a fresh character instantly. Different jobs give different amounts of statesmanship, with researchers being the lowest, governors in the middle, government offices varying a little bit on the higher end, and then rulers being the highest. Statesmanship doesn't seem to actually affect the research or governor jobs from what I could tell, so that doesn't really seem to matter. This is a nice feature, although I think they missed a pretty big opportunity to make it more engaging. Right now, it's more just about placing a character in a position and then trying not to have them ever change. It works fine, but I think it would have been nice to have it weighted so that entry-level offices grant a lot of statesmanship and then high-level offices grant barely any, but severely reduce the decay rate. Then you could have also made it affect governorships in some way. That way, you could actually progress characters through office a little bit, and then maybe give them governorship when they're older. I think that would make you remember your characters a bit more, rather than just turning them into a modifier and just leaving them there forever. The Family Rework So 1.3 has done away with the numerous families on display in the game, and instead reduced them down to just a few great families. These families all have a head of the family, and they wield power based on the prestige of their family. All characters in a family contribute to its prestige based on their jobs, their wealth, and their holdings, and if a family doesn't get a certain number of jobs, it'll become scorned, slowly lowering the loyalty of all of its members. And the loyalty hit is actually harder for every job that they are scorned by, so if they're missing three jobs, then it's three hits of that loyalty. Now on the flip side, if it gets too many jobs assigned to it, the family will actually be considered grateful, and they'll start gaining loyalty. This less is more approach is another attempt to get you familiar with your characters and their families. They are color coded, at least in some places, so you recognize them more often. And that does sort of work, but you still have all the other characters you used to. But now they're just considered minor. So now you have this conflict between choosing someone who's right for the job, or choosing someone from a family that you know. Now keeping the families happy is pretty easy, because the power from prestige is all kept at the head of the family. Low loyalty doesn't really matter if they don't have power, so this makes it easy to fix one character with bribes or whatever else to keep them happy. So just like with the previous update, 1.2, I think power is a really cool idea, but they do make it too easy to solve the issues at hand. If you had a governor, they get like 20 power from that governorship. If they have low loyalty, you just remove their governorship and then they lose all their power. Without the power, they actually regain their loyalty. It makes sense, I guess, thematically, but it's just a bit too easy to manage. Power could potentially slowly reduce over time, perhaps, or it could be spread amongst more family members, forcing you to take care of the family as a whole, rather than just the head of it. As your nation grows, you get to choose characters to start new great families from, and if you're a monarchy, you can adopt characters into your family if you wish, so that's all pretty good. As a republic, it's still kind of hard to focus on your characters because every five years, new consuls are elected and people shuffle around a lot. I think if color coding was just displayed in offices and character screens, it would probably help a little bit more to keep it focused. So let's do a quick recap on those two features, statesmanship and new families. Now from my time with it so far, it doesn't feel a whole lot different to how it was in the game before, but it has a bit more focus to it now, which is good. If they sort out the power struggles and improve the color coding of families, I think you'd get much more attached and involved with them. It really sounds like a much bigger change than it is. Gameplay wise, you don't have to adjust what you did before all that much. Next up is army food and supply. Food was added to provinces in 1.2 and it's now been added to armies in 1.3. So long as an army is carrying food, it won't take attrition, even in sieges and even at sea. This is a pretty big change because attrition was probably the number one thing that ate away at your manpower. 
but now it's really only big battles or extremely long sieges that affects it. Armies collect food over time from the province that they're standing in, so long as it's your territory, and so long as they're above the supply limit. If they're in enemy territory, they'll start to consume their food over time, unless they capture the enemy province capital. If they capture the enemy province capital, then they may resupply food from anywhere in that province. It's a good change, mainly just because it gives you more manpower. You can now even replenish your armies while you're laying siege, so it really is quite the opposite to how it worked before. However, other than that, it is pretty simple. There's no real supply chain management or anything like that. You sort of just recruit a supply train unit and then you just don't really have to think about it again. It's a bit odd because even if your army loses a fight and the supply train unit goes to zero men in the unit, they still hold all the food just fine and they consume the same amount regardless if they're full strength or not. So it does seem like just a very simple system that you don't need to think about too much. In my playthrough, I made a reserve of 6 or 7 supply trains all around Italy, fully stocked up with food ready to go in case I needed to move them up to the front line, but I never did, so it was just a waste. The last new system to cover are the missions. There's now a missions tab in the game's top bar for all nations. As of right now, only Rome and Carthage have unique missions thanks to the free Punic Wars DLC. All other countries have generic missions that generate based on where they are geographically in the world. So the way it works is that you commit to an overall agenda and that opens up a mission tree. You can only do one mission tree at a time and if you abandon it before you finish it, you take a small stability hit. Essentially, the missions are just like certain goals, you know, like taking a province, building it up, getting a certain amount of trade goods or whatever else, and that gives you short-term or permanent benefits. They have a lot of flavor text surrounding them, especially the Roman and Carthaginian ones, which fire off events every few months with walls of text. For me though, I really don't like the current missions in the game. I find that they're too heavily scripted and they just don't react to your situation enough. As Rome, I Klein stated Lucania, and then my mission asked me to occupy one of their towns. It didn't count as mine even though I Klein stated them, so it just kind of sucked that I was being forced down a path to wage war on territory that's supposed to be basically mine anyways. The mission said I was taming the Brutians and that they must accept Roman hegemony to make way for Roman access to Sicily. But this just doesn't fit. I already had access to Sicily. I was able to go through their lands. I occupied them. You know, they'd already submitted to me. So it just didn't really seem to make sense. Either way, I did complete it. And once you trigger it, you can found a city for free and then move on to the next mission in the tree. Paradox said in a developer diary that they wanted to avoid railroading with these missions, but that's exactly what they've done. Sure, I can abandon the mission and just do my own thing, but then it sort of defeats the purpose of the missions in the first place. Now I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent, and I want you to tell me if I'm crazy or not, but here's my idea for how missions could have worked. If you're a republic, you have five parties, civic, military, mercantile, religious, and populist. It would make sense to me if the missions were generated based on what those political parties in the Senate wanted based on your situation. Maybe the merchants want to produce more goods and establish more trade. Maybe military wants conquest into a certain bordering nation. Maybe civic wants a certain number of cities built by a certain date. You get the idea. You could go further. You could make it based off of the traits of the party ruler at the time. If you have a cruel military party leader, maybe his mission is to capture slaves or raise cities. Maybe a corrupt religious party leader wants you to withhold building temples and give him money in exchange for stronger omens. The list could go on. This way you'd never feel railroaded into some narrative that already exists, but instead you could make your own. I feel like these sort of missions that come from within your own government would make way more sense for the player's situation to reflect it. For instance, the military faction, taking my Lucania example, the military faction might have wanted to invade them and actually abandon the Klein state. Whereas maybe the mercantile faction would have wanted to increase trade. Maybe the civic faction would prefer integration. You know, you could do a lot of different things there. Now, similarly for a monarchy, you could get missions from your pretenders, maybe based on their loyalty, and people in office as your advisors, or if you're a tribe, they could come from the clan chiefs. These current missions feel so out of place to me. They don't utilize the strengths of the game's features, and instead they're just a very simple and they're just uninteresting. You know, it said build three cities in Picenum. Like, why? If a civic party ruler had holdings in Picenum and he wanted me to improve his estate, 
I think of it as an interesting reason to do something. I could gain favor with his party, I could build his loyalty, but maybe I'd increase his power, ooh. And with so many presented at once, I'd have to think about whose mission to do and what would give me the best benefit. You couldn't do them all. Anyways, that's what I would do, but nobody asked me. Maybe my idea sucks? Let me know. That's basically missions. You open a tree, you go through the tree, you get some benefits, you close the tree, and you move on. I will say that they are written very well, but there's just often situations where they're talking about destroying Etruria and they don't even exist. You know, that sort of thing. The final thing to touch on with 1.3 is a series of smaller updates and changes. There's been several map updates with more tribes being added in Ireland, new territories around the northern parts of the map, and some city-states in and around Sicily. There's some nice graphical changes, for instance, taking a City now sees it light up on fire on the map for a couple of months, which looks really cool, atmospheric. There's now trade lines and migration lines, so you can see where things are coming and going from. There's some new music, which is actually really good, really actually just makes the whole thing feel fresh again. And there's a new secondary outliner for smaller character-driven events. They pop up there and they kind of tell you about the character's events, but if you don't click them, you do miss them, but the event still happens. It's kind of weird. Character ambitions have been removed, or rather, consolidated into schemes. This is a bit disappointing. Previously, characters had ambitions of becoming the ruler or whatever it might have been, and if they achieved it, they'd get a benefit, but it was largely out of your control most of the time, so they seemingly removed that and just kept a few things for the schemes, which is kind of like their current actions, you know, if they're investing, if they're planning on assassinating, things like that. Here's a couple of the things that I don't like that they've changed. There used to be two lines of map modes, and now there's just one, with one less hotkey to use. It's kind of a real Paradox player problem, but if you play Paradox games, you'll, you'll understand. Now you can drag and arrange your most frequent modes, which is nice, but to get a mode that you haven't assigned, you have to open this little settings wheel, scroll through them and click on the one you want. It's just a bit of hassle, and I prefer how it was before, basically. The pause screen has also been moved to the middle of the screen, which I think is really distracting. I don't know why they put it there, but they obviously moved it because of the new outliner and it's just, it's in your face. Also, when you minimize the outliner, it goes off screen, but when you minimize the character outliner, it doesn't. And that's just a little pet peeve of mine. Lastly, this one is really small, but they changed the noise of changing the map modes from a sort of click to a sliding stone noise. I just don't like it. I'm clicking a button, I'm not moving a menu, so it just, it doesn't sound right, and it's kind of loud and obnoxious, because you do change modes quite frequently. Finally, some things that need to be addressed. The launch stuttering issue is back, so now the game runs really bad, at least for me. Not everyone has this issue, but not everyone had it on launch either. Those who do have it, the game is really stuttering. Another thing that they've done is they've removed the grouped alliances by rank. So basically, when two local powers would ally, and one became bigger than the other, the alliance would shift into a guarantee from the bigger guy to the smaller guy. I actually like that. I didn't have an issue with it, but it's been removed, so anybody can ally anybody now. It wasn't in the patch notes, though, so it could be a bug. I really don't know. One new diplomatic feature that was added, which is if you're a vassal, you can actually ask another power to be your overlord instead. So you can like switch overlords now if you meet the right conditions. You still can't ask for independence or ask a nation to support your independence in a war. Conversely, you cannot fight for someone else's independence. So I think that still really needs to be introduced. This one's more of a multiplayer feature, but you can't fight for more than one claim at a time. You've actually never been able to do that and it's always bothered me. This means that if you have 50 provinces and you're completely wiped out maybe by another nation and they own all 50 of your provinces, you can only just get one. You know, you can just refuse peace and just give them one. And it just seems a bit ridiculous, especially when it comes to multiplayer. And that's pretty much it. I've got a long list of stuff that I could probably go through, but I don't want to be overly negative. I probably come across as really negative. I liked 1.2 a lot. 1.3 is a little bit more of a minor update in my opinion, and I, I'm not as big a fan of it. If you're wondering, is it time to play Imperator since launch? Then I think yes. 1.1 added better navies, 1.2 fixed, you know, the core essence of the game. 1.3 is like minor additions, the main issue in the game still is unique nations. There's three government types, and everything else is the same. Everyone has the same units, the same trade, the same buildings. So swapping between a tribe in Gaul to a tribe in India means that you just play the exact same. You don't have to learn anything new. And that's what's hurting the game the most. I had hoped that this patch was going to make unique units and buildings and further develop individual governments so that Rome's Republic was different to Carthage's Republic, for instance. 
but they didn't. They're still the same, same laws, same jobs, same parties. And if they don't do something about that, that's more clever than just missions, then the game gets very old very fast. Definitely good for a couple playthroughs, and at the very least, good for one playthrough of each type of government, and a couple challenges maybe if you set yourself, but I guarantee you, you're gonna get tired of the game once you realize the similarities between everything. And just for clarification, I'm not trying to be unrealistic and say every nation needs something unique, but we need more than three, you know? That's just how I feel about it. I'll probably make a video in the future about my Imperator Rome wishlist that I think they can actually achieve. The next update isn't coming till Q2 2020, so that's at least April. That's a big gap, and I feel like if they don't really land that update, the game's probably done, because that's a year of support. I can't imagine they'd stick around much longer after that, and I can't imagine people would even really blame them for, you know, trying to stick with the game for a year and then moving on. So, I'll probably come up with like a wish list kind of thing of things that I think they can do that they can actually achieve and make the game better in that time frame. If you'd like to see that and you have ideas yourself, let me know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.